Okay, welcome back to Satellite Communications and Navigation Systems. I think we're up to maybe lecture 19 so far. There's the last two lectures coming up this week because there is a test for the Shenzhen students on Monday and then there's a test window that opens up from next Monday to the following Monday for the distance learning students. Uh, today's topic, or this week's topic really, is radio location. And there is an intro on the YouTube channel. There's an intro to GPS. And a discussion of GPS errors, sources of errors for GPS satellites and calculations. And those, those two lectures will provide the backbone for, you know, how navigation systems work, navigation satellite systems work. GPS is sort of the granddaddy of them all. But there are basically four either partially deployed or complete navigation satellite systems up and running now in the year 2017. And so it's you have a lot of options now and if you understand how one of them works you pretty much understand how all of them work this this idea of ranging using, using things like spread spectrum pseudocodes uh, pseudo random codes is is sort of the basics of how all of these systems work uh, so these are these two lectures watch those this week we'll do a very brief review today and then I have a little supplemental material on GPS three which is a modern upgrade to the GPS signal set that's coming online and then we'll work a problem or two as well if we have time to illustrate the concepts. Okay. Now, who here has, in truthfulness, watched any of the GPS videos yet? Anyone had a chance? A little bit. Oh, good, good. The front row is doing really good. That's okay. So, well, here's North America on the Earth, South America, Europe. Oh, I put China on the wrong, on the back side. Force a habit of giving these lectures in uh, North America for 14 years. So, uh, but of course, if you wait 24 hours, 12 hours, it'll be on the front side. And if you'll recall, there's a set of inclined orbits around the Earth. Each orbit we call a constellation in GPS. And there should be about six satellites on each constellation. I think it's four of these. The, we go into gross detail on the actual video. but. To collectively, there's at least 24 satellites available for navigation it's on the surface of the Earth. Uh, this constellation is designed, it's at a 55 degree incline. <clears throat> it's at an altitude of about 20,200 kilometers, so that would be medium Earth orbit. And that's sort of a sweet spot in terms of coverage, right? You get pretty good coverage on the surface of the Earth from each satellite. Um, but you don't have to launch it all the way to geostationary Earth orbit, where you have to crank up the transmit power for the extra path loss, <coughs> and you have to spend more money for launch. Not to mention it's kind of crowded up there, and you don't want to have stuff at geostationary Earth orbit unless you really need it. So, uh, so, we have these satellites up there. The constellations are designed so you can always see at least four to five satellites at any given spot on Earth at any given time. Now, depending on where you are on the Earth, things get a little dicier or, or not. Uh, you know, tends, the, the constellation tends to be optimized for 
basically the equator up to North America, if you're in a high latitude area on the globe, the number of good satellites that you can see starts to diminish. But generally speaking, you can always see at least four or five on the planet Earth, sometimes as many as nine or ten, if you're just in the right spot at the right time. And it turns out you only need four to do your navigation calculation because, let's say, here's the Earth. And there's a bunch of satellites above you. And you are a user with a terminal. As we discuss in the videos, these satellites are raining down spread spectrum signals. Each satellite is given its own spread, its own spectrum. And the principal uh, signal that you are decoding in your phones or whatever GPS receiver that you're using is at 1,500, 1,575 megahertz. This is called the L2 signal in GPS parlance. All of the GPS signals fall between uh, the 1 to 2 gigahertz band, which in IEEE parlance is considered the L band. I don't know if I mentioned earlier that microwave engineers have these crazy conventions where they don't ever call the band by its actual designation uh, by saying the 1500 megahertz band or the 1 to 2 gigahertz band. They, they put letters on their bands. And there's no rhyme or reason to the letters. Some of the letters are just designations. Some of the letters come from German acronyms. There's all those German scientists in the early 19, uh, 20th century that worked on electromagnetic radiation. There's, they're not in alphabetical order. It doesn't make any sense. Um, so, uh, but this, so this is the L band. All the signals are L band. So all the signals, sub, the subset of signals that emanate from a GPS satellite always are given this designation L, followed by a number and some other letters, to to explain what they look like. L two signal has the one signal on the classical GPS signal set that you can actually demodulate. And it turns out that in GPS-3, there's some extra ones that a civilian can demodulate. We'll talk about them in a second as we review the upgrades that are being made to GPS. But the important thing to know is that this L2 signal is raining down on the Earth. Every, all these signals are in the same band at the same time, continuously transmitting. And that means that you have to have some way of multiplexing them. Well, you, you use the spread spectrum signal on these to multi, demultiplex them. Kind of at your receiver, you spread out with the desired code that despreads your desired signal and spreads out the interference from all the other satellites, since each satellite has its own unique PN code, pseudo noise code, to do spreading, as we've talked about in the spread spectrum lecture. OK, so that's good. Um, now, the, one of the neat things that a spread spectrum signal allows you to do is syn synchronize your signal very carefully with respect to time. Why? Because if you have a code, a series of ones and zeros, that matches the satellite you're listening to, it's not enough to simply, as we did in our example, just multiply the code with the spread spectrum signal and hope that they line up. You've got to step in time and wait for the codes to actually align before you can demodulate the navigation message that's traveling on top of it. The navigation message that tra travels on top of these uh, satellites is very slow. It's like 50 bits per second. It's not much. It just tells you some basic interesting information like how healthy is the satellite? Uh, is it, what is the ephemeris error? Is there, what deviation does this satellite have from its ground truth um, predicted location in space. Since, you know, in theory, these are satellites are in circular orbit, we know exactly where, the, where they are. We should be able to pinpoint very precisely, if we know the time, where they are in their orbit. So this is a classic case of I know the satellite position, but I don't know my own position. So if I know, if I can decode the signals and figure out where they're coming from, maybe I can triangulate myself. And so what we do is we come up with 
what's called a pseudo range. For each satellite. And think of that as the time when codes line up. So I, we, we don't know the actual offset. If you turn on your GPS receiver, yeah, it's got a clock in it, but who knows how long it was since the last time you turned, off, turned it on. It certainly doesn't have a clock that can keep time to the precision that you need to estimate the transit times of speed of light signals, right? So your actual physical time, even if you know it's 11.35 in the morning, you don't really know down to the nanosecond what time it really is when you first turn on any electronic device, regardless of how fancy the electronics are inside that device. You turn it on and you have as an unknown the absolute time in GPS. But you can go calculate these pseudo ranges relative to one another. So what is a pseudo range? It's basically when do you step your spread spectrum signal through time to match it up and correlate with your desired signal. And what's more, because you get a little bit of, you know, you get a nice signal to noise ratio typically in a GPS receiver, at least 20 dB if you spread out all the interference. That's a pretty good signal to noise ratio, which means you, you're not limited just to the size of the chip, which is really only about one microsecond in time. How fast does light travel in one microsecond? Do I know off the top of their head? About a thousand feet. It's a foot per nanosecond. So that'd be 300 meters. 300 meters. Well, GPS receivers obviously have a lot more resolution than 300 meters. We can get a typical receiver down to about a meter or so of location without, any do, without even doing anything really fancy, as long as we're not in the skyscrapers of Shenzhen, where the radio signals bounce all over the place. So we get a couple meters of accuracy. How do we do that? Well, we do use something called super resolution. You correlate and correlate and correlate and try to find the very peak where the correlation happens, which is really equivalent to looking at the edge of when a bit starts, right? We're looking at when do bit sequences line up. Well, when does, when does the edges actually line up? If we look at the edges very carefully and we have a high signal to noise ratio, then you can sort of get this what we call super resolution where you make an estimate in time that's much finer than your actual symbol width in the time domain. The so lining up PN codes and you get a pseudo range. You say PR1 is a unit in time or position depending on how you measure it which tells you in meters when does the signal arrive? We'll call this in the textbooks the phase of the spread spectrum signal. Not to be confused with the phase of the carrier, which has, you know, is uh, how, which phase, where are you on the sinusoid when you first transmit this thing? That's way beyond the precision of GPS. We're just talking about the ones and zeros that are modulated as spread spectrum onto the carrier. When do those line up? What phase? That, that's also referred to as the phase of the signal, for better or worse. And we're basically saying, when do those chips line up? When does the sequence of chips line up with each other? And you can calculate that in meters. But of course, we don't know the actual time. So the actual transit time that the signal takes where the transit distance traveled is pseudo range one plus that absolute time offset times the speed of light. And then we can translate that into a physical set of distances, right? We use the Pythagorean theorem and say, well, I have my user x coordinate 
and I'm going to subtract off x1, use subscripts here and be consistent. And I have user y minus y1 squared plus user z minus z1 squared. So the coordinates in this expression are xn, yn, zn. These are the 3D coordinates in that same Earth-centered coordinate system we used for homework number one and look angles. 3D coordinates of the nth satellite. So what are the unknowns here? I've got one equation. This is what I measure. And here, 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 here. I got four unknowns. I always know where my satellites are, plus or minus. Those are the that orbital mechanics are beautifully predictable. So I know those. I calculate and or measure pseudo range one provided I have enough link margin. And then I don't know my absolute offset here or my three user, 3D user coordinates of my receiver there. So one equation, four unknowns. I'm not going to be able to solve that. Of course, I need three more equations. This is why it takes four total satellites, unless you start making some approximations, you know, trying to intersect it with terrain or something to get break it down to three satellites. So I measure another satellite, that's PR2. It's the exact same offset if I'm measuring everything simultaneously and keeping track of time. And I, again, I use the Pythagorean theorem. To figure out where my user terminal distance is relative to the pseudo range that I've measured. And you get the point. This follows on, <clears throat> if you have four of these, you have enough to solve the system. If you have five or more, then you can actually optimize the system. You have an over-constrained problem. You gotta find the, the best point in that system of equations. The good news is pretty straightforward problem, very easy to formulate these uh, equations, which you'll be doing on your homework number three. The bad news is that it's a highly nonlinear set of equations. So you need to apply Newton's technique, or there's a, several other techniques that are able to solve this. Okay. Now, let's look at a question here. Can't do your decoding unless you have a good signal to noise ratio. Let's work through a simple example homework problem to understand this. This is a typical open sky GPS receiver picks up approximately eight equal powered satellite signals when operated near Hartsfield Field Jackson International Airport. This is a homework problem based around the uh, airport down in Atlanta. These signals, the GPS CA codes, are 50 bit per second identification and timing data that are spread at 1.023 mega chips per second. So for to decode one bit, you need 20,000 chips, right? That would be the ratio of one times 10 to the 6 chips per second divided by 50 bits per second. So that's a processing gain of about 20,000. You are hired by the Department of Homeland Security to evaluate the ability to jam GPS receivers near the airport. If a malevolent agent has a 7 dBi Yagi antenna, it's one of those antennas that look like this, you're transmitting 15... 100 megahertz and it says uh, 
This device is plain is aimed at a plane landing one approach from five kilometers away. So you're radiating over here to a plane. There's my plane. Trying to land five kilometers away. Do we have any ham radio enthusiasts here that know what a Yagi is? Anybody played with the Yagi antenna in your class or you Oh yeah, of course you know what a Yagi antenna is. You better know what a Yagi antenna is. Um, so the question is how much jamming power is required to make the CA code have a carrier to interference ratio less than 6 dB? And assume that you've got a 0 dBi receiver antenna. The question is, how much power do you transmit in here to jam GPS five kilometers away with this simple little antenna? Okay, so let's do some calculations here. Okay, if you look up in Pratt and Brostian, we could actually work through the link details. But really, all we need to know is that the average received signals from a GPS satellite is about 10 to the minus 16 watts. That's when it is spread. And then of course, our carrier to interference ratio is going to be processing gain times my desired signal, which is PR over the noise signal plus number of users times there plus now I've got a jammer in the scenario where I turn my device on. And we said that this has to be basically 6 dBi. There is no coding, no forward error correction coding on the navigation message. So a, a, a D-spread carrier to interference rate of 6 dB would be death for, for decoding that signal. You would lose a lot of bits and you would probably would not be able to make a meaningful estimate. So, if that's the case, then this should be 6 dB. I keep in mind this formula is actually in the linear scale, so I have to convert 6 dB to linear, which would be 4. And we said that PR is 10 to the minus 16. In the problem statement, it was stated that Q was 8. I could hear 8 GPS satellites. And my noise floor, I can figure out Noise floor is 7.5 times 10 to the negative 15 watts noise power for this receiver. And that's, of course, using a bandwidth of 2 megahertz, a noise temperature, system temperature of about 270 Kelvin, which is probably optimistic. And then Boltzmann's constant, 1.39 times 10 to the negative 23rd joules per Kelvin. I multiply all those together and I get this value here. Okay, so then that's actually enough. I actually have all of, I can solve for P sub J. So without doing any calculations, P sub J is, okay, just use, use your imagination to calculate this. How, you, in this scenario, how many people say it takes more than 10 watts to jam this airplane. Raise your hand. How many people think it takes less than 10 watts? Less than 10 watts? 
How many people think it takes less than one watt? Thank you for participating, Mu Liang. We had one, uh, all those questions. The totality excluded should be the null set, and only one student raised their hands. Apparently, you don't feel like like playing my little games here up at the front of the room today. The number you solve for in this is it's just kind of surprising to me at first blush until you understand how delicately balanced these systems are. I could put 54 milliwatts of power into that antenna, aim it at an aircraft, and knock out its GPS. Navigation satellite systems are very sensitive, which is why people get extremely worried in government when you tr try to transmit anything near one of these navigation satellite bands. Okay, so that's actually one of the, the motivations for GPS-3, which is modernization of the GPS constellation of satellites. And we should note that, you know, right now, when I first started teaching this course, GPS was the only game in town, pretty much. Um, there, were, there were other s navigation satellite systems, but they didn't have nearly the, the precision or the ubiquity of GPS. That's not the case anymore. We have, if you're interested in history, for starting, starting out global positioning system. still the most commonly used one today. That was deployed by the U.S. and it's maintained by the U.S. Air Force. The first launch of a GPS satellite was actually 1978 and it became fully operational. That is the, the satellite was the constellation was completed and all of the navigation systems were activated in totality in 1995. Throughout the eighties you could still use it, it didn't have quite the precision because there were gaps in the constellation. You had to launch, you know, all thirty some satellites in order to get coverage on the Earth. <clears throat> and then you have probably GPS's chief competitor, which is GLONASS. This is the global navigation satellite system. This was started actually by the Soviets, and the mantle of this was picked up again in Russia, transferred. And the first launch was in 1982, and it became fully operational in 2011. The satellite constellation was completed. You could use it with comparable position, position uh, precision to GPS. It took a lot longer to deploy that because uh, there was a partial deployment in the 80s and then like in the 90s it sort of fell on hard times as uh, you know the Soviet uh, Union fell apart and then um, in the last 10 years they made it a priority to repopulate the constellation and bring it up to, to uh, spec. So now you have a nice option if you a lot of chips nowadays can actually do GLONASS and GPS signals simultaneously and that's great because your precision as a user gets a lot more accurate if you can tap into two separate and independent satellite systems uh, and, and 
range with both uh, sets of navigation satellite systems. And of course, we're having there's two more that we need to be aware about. Galileo, this is the European Union's answer to navigation all satellite systems. The first launch was in 2011 and expected completion in 2020. And it's a European space project, so it's never delayed. The only ones to laugh at that. Okay. And then, of course, the Chinese navigation satellite system, Baidu. What does that mean in, in uh, China? Chinese, Baidu. Seven stars in the sky. Baidu, seven stars. Okay. Bay is seven. Oh, oh, okay. I see. The Dipper or the Bear? Dipper is some major. Yeah, or some major or some minor. It's like a what? Seven stars forming a spoon. Oh, yeah, yeah. We call that the the Dipper. Probably. Is it the Big Dipper or the Little Dipper that has Polaris? <coughs> I think it's the Little Dipper, mm. which is, of course, the essential um, navigation aid historically in the pre-satellite era. You used the, the, uh, the North Star to do your navigation. So yeah, OK, Let me, I, I get to add that to my notes. Beido is the, uh, the Dipper. Does Beidou literally translate spoon? No, it's just the name of the constellation. Because classically, that's like uh, Ursa Minor, which is the little bear in Western constellation naming. Um, Although I think everybody just calls it a dipper because it looks like a spoon, right? Uh, actually, a little bit like that. Uh, uh, north. North? And, uh, is similar to spoon. Ah, I see. The North Spoon. Let me put that down in my notes here. North Spoon. Navigation system. Navigation satellite system, BDS. And this was previously known as Compass. That has a long history. Uh, this is first launched <coughs> in 2000 and it, it has been for a while operating with enough precision to do radio location above China regionally and then uh, it gets worldwide coverage upon completion with targeted precision. In 2020. Okay, well there you have it. So in just a few years, we will probably have four global satellite systems. Oh yeah. Oh that, let me guess, the Indian one. Yeah. yeah. You know what? We should put that one. What's the name? Navic. Navic. N-A-V-I-C. Navic. I don't suppose you know the completion date. I don't know. Um, Probably Navic before Galileo. <laughs> it hasn't been launched yet, but it'll be before Galileo. No, this was six satellites. Are they six, six yeah. satellites? Okay. So yeah, we have, we have, in, a little after 2020, we might have five. Very reliable. Okay.
Here's the exercise music, so we'll take a brief break. Okay, back from the exercises. I quick ran down to my desk and got the stats out on NAVIC, just so that we had a complete list, right? And I read online there's actually seven satellites launched in, here are my stats, in 2013, completed in 2016. And to be fair, this is a little bit different than the first four we mentioned because this is actually a regional navigation system. The constellation of seven satellites is in high Earth orbit and is optimized for the region above India. It's uh, seven satellites, so it's not enough to provide global coverage like the previous four systems. And, and uh, what does, does NAVIC mean anything? Sailor. Sailor. It means sailor. Is that in Sanskrit? Yeah. Sailor in Sanskrit. Why have all these nav navigation satellite systems when they all do the same thing. If you're in India, you could have five different systems that you listen to to get your position. They all give at least a meter accuracy. Why do you need all that? Well, first of all, you can use them in conjunction and it makes the accuracy better. But more than anything, most of these satellite systems are operated by a single country. Uh, in many instances, they, they serve as tools of both the civilians of that country and also the military of that country. And so for example in GPS, the US Air Force can decide to turn it off selectively to any part of the globe that it wants. It's only done that a few times in the history of the, the um, NAVSAT systems usage. but. That makes people uncomfortable. You don't want to grow to depend on a satellite system that some other country can turn off whenever you want. So there's this been, been this proliferation of replacement navigation satellites. Of course, that makes another problem now because now you have a bunch of satellite systems. They're using very similar or in some cases overlapping radio bands because there's only a finite amount of spectrum out there. You don't want to obliterate all the radio spectrum for use of navigation satellite systems. Because as you see, it's not just a case where you have to make the ab allocation up in space. You have to make sure everybody else is extremely quiet in that band down here because just a little bit of interference integrated across a cityscape can wipe out a navigation satellite system. So you might say, oh, well, I just have this tiny little transmitter here in my wall, sensor mode of some sort. I only use 1500 megahertz. Not, that's not a starter because if you have thousands and thousands of those, you render GPS useless in, a, in your city, which we saw in the last calculation. So you have to be very careful. And this was one of the motivations for the modernization of the GPS uh, satellite constellation system. So And there are some satellites that are already up there in the GPS signal that are starting to transmit some or portions of these signals. That are, but the entire GPS-3 is what, the, what it goes by. <coughs> this system, new system of satellites is not going to be active or operational for a few more years. Maybe 2018 at the earliest, possibly later. Now, in the lectures that you watched online, we had five bands, five signal bands that are used in GPS. L1, which is 1575 megahertz. And this contains the CA 
course acquisition code and the PY code. The course acquisition code is that one that clocks at about one megachip per second. That's the signal that you're using in your um, handset or laptop or whatever you're, you're using to decode and fi figure out your position. The PY code has 10 times the bandwidth. It's 10 times faster, which in theory should make it at least 10 times accurate, more accurate. All other things being held equal. And unfortunately, that's P precision code, and it's encrypted with something called the Y code, which is only known to the US Air Force, and we do not have access to that one. And then L2, down here at 1227 megahertz, contains a copy of that P encrypted with Y code. So that band is relatively useless for us civilians. There's an L3 band, which is at 1381 megahertz. If you ever see that one, nuclear war has broken out. It's only used for detonating nuclear things or testing. Every once in a while you'll see a signal on that and you'll think, oh my goodness, is it nuclear war? No, they were just testing. Uh, let's see, there's another band, L379.9 megahertz. This is kind of experimental. There's not a dedicated use to this. They use this for experimental signals and testing. I don't think there's an active uh, application for that at the moment. And then L5, this is at 11, uh, 1176 megahertz. This is for civilian safety of life used for aeronautical navigation and some other uses. But this, this is classically the one that you hone in on, L1. So that was pre before GPS-3. GPS-3, we use a new LT2C, and the C stands for civilian. This is an upgrade to the L2 band, which of course is at 1227 megahertz. And the upgrade is very interesting here. First of all, this is down in an area where, remember, only a copy of the precision code, the one that we can't use as civilians, is used at L2. So this is a set of spread spectrum signals that rides now on top of that code. Remember, this is spread spectrum. So as long as you've got the right set of codes, you can pull one signal out of each other. Otherwise, they're transmitting exactly on top of one another in both time and frequency. And the two codes on here that are my multiplexed on here is the civilian civilian moderate length code which is a 10,230 chip code that repeats every 20 milliseconds. So that is a 512 kilo chips per second code. And then there's another thing, so this is called the CM code. And then there's the civilian long length code CL code 
for short. And this is a very long code, it's 7,607. Seven hundred sixty-seven thousand co chips. Every one point five seconds. And again, that if you work out the math, that's about five hundred and twelve kilochips per second. So, if you view this civilian length code as modulating data, if you repeat every 1.5 seconds, so your code length is basically 767,000 chips, that's a tremendous amount of processing gain. You can't trans transmit that much stuff in that time, but you get a lot of processing gain. The problem with using codes that big is acquisition, right? When you first turn on a GPS receiver out of the box, Let's say you built it in Shenzhen and then you shipped it to India and you turned it on. But the receiver has no idea where on earth it is. So what does it have to do? It has to sit there and basically step through all of the possible correlations of the codes and possible time shifts. So you know there's probably, I don't know what the total number is, but there's at least 30 satellites out there. There are more codes allotted if you wanted to increase this, the constellation size. There's this huge code bank book of possible codes, so you just pick one. And then you have to step through in time and figure out where does that phase actually line up. So that code repeats itself every, that the course acquisition code, the one that's currently used in GPS, repeats itself every 1,023 chips. So that means you have to sit there and integrate 1,023 times. And if you don't get an integration, you say, well, I guess I can't hear that satellite. So then you move to the next one. So you gotta do that signal processing, correlate up to 1,023 times. Throw that one away if you don't see it. And you do the next one. Hopefully at some point you see a correlation peak where you line up with the signal and say, hey, this lines up nicely. I get a nice peak. This satellite must exist and it exists with this pseudo range or phase. And then once you do that, it's, it's a lot better because you can decode your actual time. You can kind of guess where you are on Earth, at least which you know within a few hundred kilometers at that point. And then you know what the time is, and then you can figure out what the satellite should be in view. And if your GPS has any sort of flash memory on board, then when you power it down, it remembers, oh yeah, I was powered up in India. I've got a crude clock running. It's not enough to do precision location. But the next time I'm turned on, I know it's Oh, it's 11 a.m. Uh, on a Thursday afternoon, May the 17th or whatever. And it says, okay, I expect these satellites to be in view. And it can sort of limit its search. So for that reason, when you first turn on a GPS satellite receiver, it can take five to 10 minutes out of the box to figure out where it is and do the correlation. After that, it should be relatively quickly, just a matter of a few seconds in the shortest cases maybe 30 seconds or 60 seconds uh, to get a reasonable correlation across all of the satellites it can hear. So, and that's just with a 1,023 chip. So, so there's a lot of benefit to using this long length code. You could probably get in the basement of this building and do ranging if you had that long length code available. You can survive uh, big degradations in signal to noise ratio because you can spread out so much interference with that long code. The problem lies in acquisition. Now you'd have, if you had only the long length code to correlate with, you would actually have to step through 767,000 correlations for each potential satellite. And so what that moderate length code helps with is uh, synchronizing. Because you can synchronize with a moderate length code relatively quickly, get what the phase of that is, and then you know with uh, much more precision what the phase of your 767,000 long code length should be. And so you, you would kind of know what range to begin or end your correlation. 
with that longboard if you did if you decoded the civilian moderate length code. So that's why that that structure looks like that. These are actually multiplexed onto the same radio signal. So basically every other bit, one bit is from the M CM code, one bit is from the CL code, and they're interleaved or multiplexed onto the same RF channel. So the, in terms of bandwidth, it really looks like this coarse acquisition code. It's a spread spectrum signal. You just have to tease out two different signals inside. It'll ride on top of the existing P code, contributing a little bit of interference to that and also receiving a little bit of ear in interference to that code, but is available for civilian operation. Now, what are the benefits of, of having it down at 1227? Anybody think of any? There's something neat you can do that you could never do before in GPS. Well, it turns out, we talked about this in the video, one of the biggest sources of error in GPS is atmospheric delay, particularly the ionosphere. The ionosphere, because of the lightly charged medium, um, it will retard the group velocity of electromagnetic waves slightly. Not that much, but it's enough to add a significant error to GPS. You know, usually three or four meters, ten up to ten meters in some instances, depends on the time of day where you are on the Earth. And it's somewhat unpredictable because you know, I ionosphere is, uh, has sort of its own weather, it fluctuates during the course of a day as the sun comes up and goes down behind the earth. And the, uh, the way to get rid of that error now is to decode the message on a GPS navigation satellite signal and get some crude local information. That's one of the things that's transmitted on that 50 bits per second navigation signal riding on top of the spread spectrum signal that's used to compute pseudo ranges. You decode that signal and after a while you've got enough precision to, to estimate maybe what the local ionosphere correction, but it's very crude. Another way to sa satisfy that is to use something called augmented GPS where you grab a signal from the earth that's transmitting some localized corrections. And this happens on TV stations or some designated beacon bands, uh, depending on what country you're in. <clears throat> and this will be basically say, well, you know, here's your localized correction factor for the ionosphere at this point in time. They're always measuring it, usually by studying the GPS signal to a known reference on the Earth in your local area, and then reporting what that correction factor should be to all the receivers that have the ability to listen to that kind of augmented signal. Well, if you have another frequency that you can range on, that's ideal because ionospheric effects, while they fluctuate over time, are very predictable as a function of frequency. Uh, the, as you go higher and higher in frequency, the ionospheric effect tails off considerably. You probably can't even measure much of the delay if you go up above maybe 10 or 20 gigahertz. But those frequencies aren't very suitable for broadcast satellite navigation signals. So instead, if you send two signals at two different frequencies that you can range off of, you can actually look at the clock difference, the absolute time difference, and ca calculate your own personal ionospheric correction factor. So that takes out one of the worst contributing errors to GPS. I think it's actually that second lecture online YouTube where we work through what are the different errors of GPS and figure out how to kind of calculate them in a, uh, if they're treating them as independent, and demonstrating how the um, precision of your at range estimate changes going from uh, corrected GPS to just sort of a full blown, uh, no uncorrected GPS. So that, that takes out a sizable amount of error in your calculation when you can do that. 
And so now there's the freedom to do that in this future upgrade to GPS. So there's also a nav message riding on here that is similar to the navigation message, except this is the year 2017, so there's a plan. It's again 50 bits per second, but there is a plan to use one half convolutional coding. So a relatively simple form of forward error correction that will dramatically increase the signal, the decodability of the navigation message. So that really it's 25 real data bits per second. Because we recall from our forward error correction lecture online that one half means you're adding 100% redundancy into your signal to get better performance over the wireless channel. 25 real data bits per second. So it's interesting, it's always interesting to retrofit technology and make sure things are downwardly compatible. Here we've taken this high grade, military grade PN sequence that every J GPS satellite is transmitting. Obviously, since the US Air Force still owns GPS, they don't want to obliterate that signal. So this signal, um, is that, that has these new L2C codes is actually transmitted with less power than the course acquisition codes of L1 or excuse me uh, yeah L1 up to 15 megahertz 1500 megahertz and this because of some of the improvements in filtering and the addition of forward air correction, it actually decodes with a higher signal to noise ratio, which helps in ranging, as you probably saw when you, we went over the uh, ranging calculation for GPS course acquisition codes. So this just makes our, it doesn't actually add that much precision to the calculation of your position as a civilian, everyday user of GPS. But it makes it much more robust, much, it basically cuts off the tail of your error significantly and it makes sure that you can get the um, satellite signal indoors in a lot of cases or with heavy shadowing in some instances and also helps to overcome multipath effects and other things when you use that really uh, long spread spectrum sequence okay so what else there are just a few other improvements I should mention to GPS-3. There's a military code called the M code. This is kind of like the P encrypted with Y code that we talked about earlier, uh, except it's dramatically improved and it's meant to be autonomous. You can, if you have a military grade GPS receiver, you can receive your location using the M code without decoding any other signals. That is all we know about this code, pretty much. It won't publish the sig signal structure or tell us how it's encrypted or anything like that. So we don't need to worry about it. It is transmitted on L1 and L2, the tw 1200 and the 1500 megahertz GPS bands. So there are actually upgraded GPS satellites um, Oh, one other thing I should mention, L1C. This, there's an L1C signal that repeats the course acquisition signal at 12, 
1277, I believe. Yeah, 1277, or 1227 megahertz. So that allows you to, to have the ionospheric correction factor as well if you're just do, using the CA code, the course acquisition code on GPS. So when does this all deploy? Some of these signals are actually already upgraded even though technically the US hasn't launched any GPS-3 block satellites. Um, the last generation of GPS-2 satellites actually have the radios on board that can transmit a lot of these, of these signals. So some of these signals are already active or in a quasi-active mode. Uh, the actual launch of GPS-3 is expected next year, 2018. Yes? Why the L1C is not at the same frequency as L1? Why is the L1C not at the same frequency as L1? That's a good question. It really should be the L2C if it's an L2, because L2, according to the way that we usually talk about GPS bands, is 1227 megahertz. I don't know, I have to go look that one up. Here's our band designations. You're right, L2 is 1200. So if L1 is repeated at 1200 then it should be L2. I don't know why they call it the L1C. I have to look at my notes again. Any other questions? Well, I don't have any more problems to work. So if you want, we'll knock off a few minutes early. <laughs>